you. Yes, I've just moved to this area with my wife and children, and I'd like to know where we can all register with a doctor at a health centre. Yeah.、Oh, okay.、Uh, well, there's Dr. Green at the Harvey Clinic. We always recommend her for babies because she's very good with them, and she runs a special clinic. Oh,、uh, actually, my youngest child is five, so that wouldn't be any good for us. Right. Is there anywhere else I could try? Yes, the Eshkol Health Practice is the next one on my list. How do you spell that? E S H C O L, and it's Dr. Fuller who has space on his list. The clinic only opened a year ago, so the facilities are all very modern. That sounds good. Hmm, and it's particularly good if you're busy during the day because they also do appointments in the evening. Hmm. They're closed on Saturday, though. The only other place on the list is the health centre on Shaw Lane. You can register with Dr. Gormley.、Uh, that's G O R M L E Y. He's new there, but the centre has a very good reputation. Oh yes, I think I know the road. That would be the best one. Thanks. Could you tell me, will all their services be free? Ah,、uh, there are usually some small charges that doctors make.、Uh, let me see what it says about the Shaw Lane Centre. If you need to be vaccinated before any trips abroad, you won't have to pay for this. Ah,、uh, what else? The Sports Injury Treatment Service operates on a paying basis. As does the nutritional therapy service.、Mm -hmm. Some health centres do offer alternative therapies like homeopathy as part of their pay-to-use service. Shawlane are hoping to do this soon. I think they may start with acupuncture. Oh. And finally, if you need to prove you're healthy or haven't had any serious injuries before a new employer will accept you, you can get a free fitness check up there. But you'd most likely have to pay for insurance medicals, though. Okay. Thanks. You might also be interested to know the centre is running a pilot scheme of talks for patients. I've got the list here. Actually, they look very interesting. What sort of things? Well, the first one's about giving up smoking. It's next week, the twenty fifth of February at seven p.m., and that's in room four. It says the talk will stress the health benefits, particularly for people with asthma. Or heart disease. That sounds very interesting. There's also a talk for families with children. It's on healthy eating and takes place on the first of March at five o'clock. Will that be at the health centre? Um, actually, it's at the primary school on Shaw Lane. I imagine they're inviting the parents of pupils there. It says here, all welcome. Hmm. I might go to that if I have time. There's a couple of other talks. One giving advice about how to avoid injuries while doing exercise.、Mm -hmm. It's on the ninth of March. Oh, it's a late afternoon talk at four thirty, and it'll be in room six. It also says the talk is suitable for all ages. And finally, there's a talk called stress management, which is on the. Hello. Hi, it's Laura Carlton here. We've just arrived at the holiday flat, but I can't get the hot water and heating to work. Oh right, that's easy. Don't worry. In the upstairs cupboard, you'll find the water heater. You'll see three main controls on the left at the bottom of the heater. The first one, the round one on the far left, is the most important one for the heating and hot water. It's the main control switch. Make sure it's in the on position. The switch itself doesn't light up, but the little square below will be black if the switch is off. <laughs> That's probably what's happened. It's got switched off by mistake. The middle one of these three controls—you'll see it's slightly larger than the first one—controls the radiators. If you feel cold while you're there and need the radiators on, this needs to be turned to maximum. The last of the three controls, the one on the right. Is usually on about a number four setting, which for the water in the taps is usually quite hot enough. Below the heating controls in the middle is a small round plastic button. If there isn't enough water in the pipes, sometimes the heater goes out. If this happens, you'll need to press this button to reset the heater. Hold it in for about five seconds, and the heater should come on again. 
Then there's a little square indicator under the third knob that's a kind of alarm light. It'll flash if you need to reset the heater.、Mm, it sounds complicated. <laughs> I'm sure you won't have any problems with it. There should be some more instructions on the side of the heater. Call me back if you can't make it work. Okay. While you're on the phone, we haven't managed to find a few things we need, like extra pillows for the beds and some washing powder. Is there any here? Pillows,、uh, yes. If you look in the cupboard, the large white one upstairs, to the left of the bathroom door, there should be four or five on the top shelf. And if you want to do some washing, there's some powder for that. Um, <laughs> probably by the back door. There's a kind of shelf there above the sink. In fact, I'm sure there's some there in a large blue box. You need about half a cupful for each wash. Oh, and that reminds me, the spare key to the back door is hanging on a hook on the wall by the sitting room window. Please make sure to put it back when you've used it. The previous guest lost it in the garden, and I had to get another one made. And if you have any trouble with the lamps. You'll find some spare bulbs in a large cardboard box. It's on top of the washing machine with all kinds of useful things in it. Oh, and another thing I forgot to mention when we last spoke. Yes. I've left you a local map, so you'll be able to find your way around easily. It shows the whole area. I put it in the top drawer of the chest under the TV in your bedroom. There's a whole file of local information in there too. Thanks. What about visiting the town? Can you give us any advice? Yes, you'll need to take the car. It's too far to walk from the flat, really. You have to pay to leave your car in all the car parks now. I'm afraid. I like the one that's by the station best, and you can walk to the town centre from there in five minutes. That's where all the best restaurants are. But if you want a takeaway, the Italian one does really good pasta and pizzas. Call. Seven three double two eight one for that one, or seven double six double one nine for the Chinese. They're both good, and they'll both deliver to the flat. As for places to visit, yes, do go and see the railway museum. The exhibition is small but really good. It gets very crowded on Sundays, so I suggest you visit it on a quieter day later in the week. But not on Thursdays, which is market day. You won't find anywhere to park, and it's also the only day of the week when they're not open. Anything else? Not for the moment, thanks. Ira, how are you? Fine, thanks, Paul. How are you? Well, thanks. It's good to see you. It must be twelve months since you did our course. That's right. It's nice to come back and say hello. What course did you enroll in? Actually, I went straight into third-year pharmacy. They credited me with two years, which probably made it more difficult for me. Hmm. On the other hand, you were lucky to be granted credits. Is that why you chose the course? Yes. And as I'd already finished a course in it in my country, I thought it would be easier if I studied something I already knew. I didn't realize you went into third year. I thought you started in first year. No wonder it was so hard. And what do you think is one of the big differences between studying at a university here and studying in your country? Well, I found it very difficult to write assignments because I wasn't familiar with that aspect of the system here. The main problem is that the lectures expect you to be critical. That made me feel really terrible. I thought, how can I possibly do it? How can I comment on someone else's research when they probably spent five years doing it? I think a lot of people who come from overseas countries have similar problems, but after a while, it became easier for me. People expect you to have problems with the process of reading and writing, but in fact, it is more a question of altering your viewpoint towards academic study. Hmm.、Uh, how was the content of the lectures? Was it easy for you? I didn't really have many problems understanding lectures. The content was very similar to what I'd studied before. And what about the lecturers themselves? Are they essentially the same as lecturers in your country?、Uh, well, actually, no. Here they're much easier to approach. After every lecture, you can go and ask them something you didn't understand, 
Or you can make an appointment and talk to them about anything in the course. Maybe you found them different because you're a more mature student now, whereas when you were studying in your country, you were younger and not so assertive. No, I don't think that's the difference. Hmm. Most of the students here do it. In my faculty, they all seem to make appointments, usually to talk about something in the course that's worrying them, but sometimes just about something that might really interest them, something they might want to specialize in. Hmm. The lecturers must set aside certain times every week when they're available for students. That's good to hear. And how was your timetable? Was it a very busy year? Oh, very, very busy. They make you work very hard. Apart from lectures, we had practical sessions in a lot of subjects. We did these in small groups. I had to go and work four hours every week in a community pharmacy. Hmm. Actually, I enjoyed this very much, meeting new people all the time. Then in second semester, we had to get experience in hospital dispensaries. So every second day, we went to one of the big hospitals and worked there. And on top of all that, we had our assignments, which took me a lot of time. Oh, I nearly forgot. Between first and second semesters, we had to work full-time for two weeks in a hospital. That does sound a very heavy year. So... Are you pleased now that you did it? Do you feel some sense of achievement? Yeah, I do feel much more confident, which I suppose is the most important thing. And have you got any recommendations for people who are studying from overseas? Well, I suppose they need very good English. It would be much better if they spent more time learning English before they enter the university, because you can be in big trouble if you don't understand what people are saying and you haven't got time to translate. Hmm. Uh, anything else? Well, as I said before, the biggest problem for me was lack of familiarity with the education system here. It sounds as if it was a real challenge. Congratulations, Kira. Thanks, Paul. Good morning. Today I'd like to present the findings of our Year 2 project on wildlife found in gardens throughout our city. I'll start by saying something about the background to the project then talk a little bit about our research techniques, and then indicate some of our interim findings. First of all, how did we choose our topic? Well, there are four of us in the group, and one day, while we were discussing a possible focus, two of the group mentioned that they had seen yet more sparrowhawks, one of Britain's most interesting birds of prey, in their own city center gardens, and wondered why they were turning up in these gardens in great numbers. We were all very engaged by the idea of why wild animals would choose to inhabit a city garden. Why is it so popular with wildlife when the countryside itself is becoming less so? The first thing we did was to establish what proportion of the urban land is taken up by private gardens. We estimated that it was about one-fifth, and this was endorsed by looking at large-scale usage maps in the town land survey office, 24% to be precise. Our own informal discussions with neighbors and friends led us to believe that many garden owners had interesting experiences to relate regarding wild animal sightings. So we decided to survey garden owners from different areas of the city. Just over 100 of them completed a survey once every two weeks for 12 months, ticking off species they had seen from a pro forma list, and adding the names of any rarer ones. Meanwhile, we were doing our own observations in selected gardens throughout the city. We deliberately chose smaller ones because they were by far the most typical in the city. The whole point of the project was to look at the norm, not the exception. Alongside this primary research on urban gardens, we were studying a lot of books about the decline of wild animals in the countryside and thinking of possible causes for this. So what did we find? Well... So much that I just won't have time to tell you about here. If you're interested in reading our more comprehensive findings, we've produced detailed graphic representations on the college website. And, of course, any of the group would be happy to talk to you about them. Just email us. What we've decided to present today is information about just three species because we felt these gave a good indication of the processes at work in rural and urban settings as a whole. The first species to generate a lot of interesting information was frogs, and there was a clear pattern here. They proliferate where there is suitable water. 
Garden ponds are on the increase. Rural ponds are disappearing, leading to massive migration to the towns. Hedgehogs are also finding it easier to live in urban areas, this time because their predators are not finding it quite so attractive to leave their rural environment, so hedgehogs have a better survival rate in cities. We had lots of sightings, so all in all we had no difficulties with our efforts to count their numbers precisely. Our final species is the finest of bird singers, the song thrush. On the decline in the countryside, They are experiencing a resurgence in urban gardens because these days gardeners are buying lots of different plants, which means there's an extensive range of seeds around, which is what they feed on. Another factor is the provision of nesting places, which is actually better in gardens than the countryside. Hard to believe it, but it's true. Incidentally, we discovered that a massive new survey on song thrushes is about to be launched, so you should keep an eye open for that. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Hi, George. Glad you're back. Loads of people have phoned you. Really? I felt just like your secretary. Sorry. I went into the library this afternoon to have a look at a newspaper, and I came across something really interesting. What? A book? No, a brochure from a summer festival, mainly Spanish music. Look, I've got it here. Spanish music? I really love the guitar. Let's have a look. So what's this group, uh, Guitarini? They're really good. They had a video with all the highlights of the festival at a stand in the lobby to the library, so I heard them. They play fantastic instruments, drums and flutes and old kinds of guitars. I've never heard anything like it before. Sounds great. Okay, shall we go then? Spoil ourselves? Yes, let's. The only problem is there aren't any cheap seats. It's all one price. Well, in that case, we could sit right at the front. We'd have a really good view. Yeah, though I think that if you sit at the back, you can actually hear the whole thing better. Mm, Yes. Anyway, we can decide when we get there. So will you fill in the form, or shall I? I'll do it. Name, George O'Neill. Address, 48 North Avenue, West Sea. Do you remember our new postcode? Still can't remember it. Mm, Just a minute. I've got it written down here. Ah, WS62YH. Do you need the phone, too? Please. I'm really bad at numbers. 01674-553-242. So let's book two tickets for Guitarini. Okay. If you're sure, seven fifty each is all right. How do you feel about the singer? Mm, I haven't quite decided. But I've noticed something on the booking form that might just persuade me. What's that, then? Free refreshments. Really? Yes, look here. Sunday, 17th of June. Singer. Ticket, six pounds, includes drinks in the garden. Sounds like a bargain to me. <laughs> yes, Let's book two tickets for that. So, what else? I'm feeling quite keen now. How about the pianist on the 22nd of June? Anna Ventura. I've just remembered that's my evening class night. Mm, That's okay. I'll just have to go on my own. But we can go to the Spanish dance and guitar concert together, can't we? Yes, I'm sure Tom and Kieran would enjoy that too. Good heavens, £10.50 a ticket. I can see we're going to have to go without food for the rest of the week. (laughs) We'll need to book four. Ah, wish we were students. Look, children, students and senior citizens get a 50% discount on everything. If only. Hello, and thank you for asking me to your teacher's meeting to talk about the Dinosaur Museum and to tell you a bit about what you can do with your students there. Well, let me give you some of the basic information first. In regard to opening hours, we're open every day of the week from 9am to 8pm, except on Mondays, when we close at 1.30pm. And in fact, the only day in the year when we're closed is on the 25th of December. You can book a guided tour for your school group any time that we're open. If you bring a school group to the museum... When you arrive, we ask you to remain with your group in the car park. 
One or more of the tour guides will welcome you there and brief you about what the tour will be about. We do this there because our entrance is quite small and we really haven't got much room for briefing groups in the exhibition area. As far as the amount of time you'll need goes, if you bring a school group, you should plan on allowing a minimum of 90 minutes for the visit. This allows 15 minutes to get on and off the coach, 45 minutes for the guided tour and 30 minutes for after-tour activities. If you're going to have lunch at the museum, you will of course have to allow more time. There are two cafes in the museum with seating for 80 people. If you want to eat there, you'll need to reserve some seating as they can get quite crowded at lunchtime. Then outside the museum at the back there are tables and students can bring their own lunch and eat it there in the open air. When the students come into the museum foyer, we ask them to check in their backpacks with their books, lunch boxes, etc. at the cloakroom before they enter the museum proper. I'm afraid in the past we have had a few things gone missing after school visits, so this is a strict rule. Also, some of the exhibits are fragile and we don't want them to be accidentally knocked. But we do provide school students with handouts with questions and quizzes on them. There's so much that students can learn in the museum and it's fun for them to have something to do. Of course, they'll need to bring something to write with for these. We do allow students to take photographs. For students who are doing projects, it's useful to make some kind of visual record of what they see that they can add to their reports. And finally, they should not bring anything to eat into the museum or drinks of any kind. There are also a few things that students can do after the tour. In the theatreette on the ground floor, there are continuous screenings of short documentaries about dinosaurs which they can see at any time. We used to have an activity room with more interactive things like making models of dinosaurs and drawing and painting pictures, even hunting for dinosaur eggs. But unfortunately, the room was damaged in a bad storm recently when water came in the roof, so that's closed at the moment. But we do have an IT centre where students have access to CD-ROMs with a range of dinosaur games. These games are a lot of fun, but they also teach the students about the lives of dinosaurs, how they found food, protected their habitat, survived threats, that kind of thing. And um, I think that's all I have to tell you. Please feel free to ask any questions if you would like to know anything else. about. Right, Sandra. You wanted to see me to get some feedback on your group's proposal, the one you're submitting for the Geography Society field trip competition. Uh-huh. I've had a look through your proposal, and I think it's a really good choice. <laughs> In fact... I only have a few things to say about it, but even in an outline document like this, you really have to be careful to avoid typos and problems with layout in the proposal, and even in the contents page. So read it through carefully before submitting it, okay? Will do. And I've made a few notes on the proposal about things which could have been better sequenced. Okay. As for the writing itself, I've annotated the proposal as and where I thought it could be improved. Generally speaking, I feel you've often used complex structures and long sentences for the sake of it, and as a consequence, although your paragraphing and inclusion of subheadings help, it's quite hard to follow your train of thought at times. Oh. So cut them down a bit, can you? Really? Yes, and don't forget simple formatting like numbering. Didn't I use page numbers? I didn't mean that. Look, you've remembered to include headers and footers, which is good, but listing ideas clearly is important. Number them or use bullet points, which is even clearer. Then you'll focus the reader on your main points. I thought your suggestion to go to the Navajo Tribal Park was a very good idea. No, oh, I've always wanted to go there. My father was a great fan of cowboy films and the Wild West, so I was subjected to seeing all the epics. 
many of which were shot there. Mm -hmm. As a consequence, it feels very familiar to me, and it's awesome, both geographically and visually. So it's somewhere I've always wanted to visit. The subsequent research I did and the online photographs made me even keener. Interesting. Right, let's look at the content of your proposal now. Did you find it comprehensive enough? Well, yes and no. You've listed several different topics on your contents page, but I'm not sure they're all relevant. No? Well, I thought that from the perspective of a field trip, one thing I needed to focus on was the sandstone plateau and cliffs themselves. The way they tower up from the flat landscape is just amazing. The fact that the surrounding softer rocks were eroded by wind and rain, leaving these huge outcrops high above the plain. It's hardly surprising that tourists flock to see the area. Well, yes, I'd agree with including those points. And then the fact that it's been home to Native American Navajos and all the social history that goes with that. The hardships they endured trying to save their territory from the invading settlers. Their culture is so rich. All those wonderful stories. Well, I agree it's interesting, but it's not immediately relevant to your proposal, Sandra. So, at this stage, I suggest you focus on other considerations. I think an indication of what the students on the trip could actually do when they get there should be far more central, so that certainly needs to be included and to be expanded upon. And I'd like to see something about the local wildlife and vegetation, too. Not that I imagine there's much to see. Presumably the tourist invasion hasn't helped. Okay, <clears throat> I'll do some work on those two areas as well. But you're right, there's not much apart from some very shallow-rooted species— Although it's cold and snowy there in the winter, the earth is baked so hard in the summer sun that rainwater can't penetrate. Mm -hmm. So it's a case of flood or drought, really. So I understand. Now, before we look at everything in more detail, I've got a few factual questions for you. It would be a good idea to include the answers in your finished proposal, because they're missing from your draft. Fine. So, you mentioned the monoliths and the spires, which was good. But what area does the tribal park cover? Do you know? 12,000 hectares. And the plain is at about 5,850 meters above sea level. Mm, larger than I expected. Okay. Where's the nearest accommodation? That's a practical detail that you haven't included. Have you done any research on that? Yes. There's nowhere to stay in the park itself, but there's an old trading post called Goulding quite near. All kinds of tours start from Goulding, too. What kind of tours? Well, the most popular are in four-wheel drive jeeps, but I wouldn't recommend hiring those. I think the best way to appreciate the area would be to hire horses instead and trek around on those. Biking is not allowed, and it's impossible to drive around the area in private vehicles. The tracks are too rough. Okay. Lastly, what else is worth visiting there? There are several caves, but I haven't looked into any details. I'll find out about them. Okay, good. Now what I'd like to know is more about... So, welcome to your introductory geography lecture. We'll begin with some basics. Firstly, what do we learn by studying geography? Well, we learn a great deal about all the processes that have affected and that continue to affect the Earth's surface. But we learn far more than that, because studying geography also informs us about the different kinds of relationships that develop between a particular environment and the people that live there. OK, we like to think of geography as having two main branches. There's the study of the nature of our planet, its physical features, what it actually looks like, and then there's the study of the ways in which we choose to live and of the impact of those on our planet. Our current use of carbon fuels is a good example of that. 
But there are more specific study areas to consider too, and we'll be looking at each of these in turn throughout the semester. These include biophysical geography, by which I mean the study of the natural environment and all its living things. Then there's topography, that looks at the shapes of the land and oceans. There's the study of political geography and social geography too, of course, which is the study of communities of people. We have economic geography, in which we examine all kinds of resources and their use, agriculture, for example. Next comes historical geography, the understanding of how people and their environments and the ways they interact have changed over a period of time. And urban geography, an aspect I'm particularly interested in, which takes as its focus the location of cities, the services that those cities provide, and migration of people to and from such cities. And lastly, we have cartography. That's the art and science of map making. You'll be doing a lot of that. So, to summarise before we continue, we now have our key answer. Studying this subject is important because without geographical knowledge, we would know very little about our surroundings and we wouldn't be able to identify all the problems that relate to them. So, by definition, we wouldn't be in an informed position to work out how to solve any of them. OK, now for some practicalities. What do geographers actually do? Well, we collect data to begin with. You'll be doing a lot of that on your first field trip. How do we do this? There are several means. We might, for example, conduct a census, count a population in a given area, perhaps. We also need images of the Earth's surface, which we can produce by means of computer generation technology or with the help of satellite relays. We've come a very long way from the early exploration of the world by sailing ships when geographers only had pens and paper at their disposal. After we've gathered our information, we must analyse it. We need to look for patterns, most commonly those of causes and consequences. This kind of information helps us to predict and resolve problems that could affect the world we live in. But we don't keep all this information confidential. We then need to publish our findings so that other people can access it and be informed by it. And one way in which this information can be published is in the form of maps. You'll all have used one at some stage of your life already. Let's consider the benefits of maps from a geographer's perspective. Maps can be folded and put in a pocket and can provide a great store of reference when they're collected into an atlas. They can depict the physical features of the entire planet if necessary, or just a small part of it in much greater detail. But there is a drawback. You can't exactly replicate something that is three-dimensional, like our planet, on a flat piece of paper, because paper has only two dimensions. And that means there'll always be a certain degree of distortion on a map. It can't be avoided. We can also use aerial photographs, pictures taken by cameras at high altitude above the Earth. These are great for showing all kinds of geographical features that are not easy to see from the ground. You can easily illustrate areas of diseased trees or how much traffic is on the roads at a given time or information about deep seabeds, for example. Then there are Landsats. These are satellites that circle the Earth and transmit visual information to computers at receiving stations. They circle the Earth several times a day and can provide a mass of information. You'll all be familiar with the information they give us about the weather, for example. So, what we're going to do now is look at a short presentation in which you'll see all these tools... Good morning, Total Insurance. Judy speaking. How may I help you? I recently shipped my belongings from overseas back here to Australia and I took out insurance with your company. Some items were damaged during the move, so I need to make a claim. What do I have to do? OK, well, first I need to get a few details about this. Can you give me your name, please? Yes, it's Michael Alexander. OK, and your address, please? 
My old address or my current one? Your current one. It's 24 Manly Street, Milpera, near Sydney. What was the suburb, sorry? Milpera. M I L P E R R A. Right. Now, who was the shipping agent, Mr. Alexander?、Mm, you mean the company we used? Yes, the company who packed everything up at the point of origin. Oh, it was, um,、uh, first class movers. Okay.、Uh, where were the goods shipped from? China, but the ship came via Singapore and was there for about a week. Don't worry, all of that information will be in the documentation. Now, the dates. Do you know when the ship arrived? It left on the 11th of October and got to Sydney on the 28th of November. Okay. I need one more thing. There's a reference number. It should be in the top right hand corner of the pink form they gave you.、Uh, let me have a look. I have so many papers. Ah, yes, here it is. It's 601 ACK. Thanks. I need to take down a few details of the actual damage over the phone before you put in a full report. Can you tell me how many items were damaged and what the damage was? Yes, well, four things actually. I'll start with the big things. My TV, first of all. It's a large one, very expensive. Our insurance doesn't cover electrical problems. It isn't an electrical problem. The screen has a huge crack in it, so it's unusable. I see. Any idea of the price to repair it? No. Well, I don't think it can be repaired. It will need a new one. OK. I'll make a note of that and we'll see what we can do. Now, what was the second item? The cabinet from the bathroom was damaged as well. It's a lovely cabinet. We use it to keep our towels in. And what is the extent of the damage? Well, the back and the sides seem OK, but the door has a huge hole in it. It can't be repaired. I'm really not very happy about it. And how much do you think it will cost to replace it? Well, when I bought it last year, I paid $125 for it. But the one I've seen here in Sydney is a bit more expensive. It's $140. Right. And what was the third item? My dining room table. It's a lovely table from Indonesia. It must have been very hot inside the container because one leg has completely split down the middle. The top and the other three look OK, thank goodness. Any idea of the price to repair it? Well, I had an estimate done on this actually because it is a very special table to us. They quote it as $200, which is really pricey, so I hope the insurance will cover the total cost. I'm sure that will be fine.、Uh, what was the last item, Mr. Alexander? Well, we have a lovely set of china plates and dishes, you know, with matching cups, saucers, the lot. They were all in the one box, which must have got dropped because some plates were broken. Six, actually. And can you tell me the replacement value of these? Well, it's hard to say because they were part of a set, but they can be up to $10 each as it's such a good set. OK, a y so that would be around $60 altogether. Yes, that's right. And is that all of the items? Yes. So, what do I have to do now? Welcome to Greenvale Agricultural Park. As you know, we've only been open a week, so you're amongst our first visitors. We have lots of fascinating indoor and outdoor exhibits on our huge complex, spreading hundreds of hectares. Our remit is to give educational opportunities to the wider public, as well as to offer research sites for a wide variety of agriculturists and other scientists. Let's start by seeing what there is to do. As you can see、uh, here on our giant wall plan, we are now situated in the reception block here. As you walk out of the main door into the park, there's a path you can follow. If you follow this route, you'll immediately come into the rare breeds section, where we keep a wide variety of animals, which I shall be telling you a little more about later. Next to this,、uh, moving east, is the large grazing area for the rare breeds.、Uh, then, further east, in the largest section of our park, is the forest area. Um, south of the grazing area, and in fact, just next to the reception block, is our experimental crop area. In the middle of the park, this 
circular area is our lake. Now, these two small rectangular shapes here are the fish farms where we rear fish for sale. To the east of those is the marsh area, which attracts a great many migrant birds. Uh, in the southeastern corner, beyond the marsh, is our market garden area, growing vegetables and flowers. All these areas can be visited by the general public for almost all the year. Although, uh, please take note of the large signs at the entrance to each area, which tell uh, which tell you when certain areas are being used for particular controlled experiments, and are therefore temporarily out of bounds to the public. You can see for yourself what a huge area the park covers, and a key question is always. How can we move around? Well, you have a choice of means. All environmentally friendly.、Um, cars are banned in the park. We have bicycles, which you can hire behind the reception block. Here,、uh, the healthy ones of you can go on foot. And finally, there's our electric tram powered from solar cells. You find more information about this at the front entrance. A good place to start on your tour is the rare breed section. We keep goats, sheep, and hens, and other kinds of poultry. We're also thinking of bringing in cows and horses, but we do not, as yet, have facilities for these bigger animals. The animals are fed in public twice a day, and a short lecture given on their feeding habits and nutritional needs. These are very popular with the public, but、uh, of course, we mustn't lose sight of the main purpose of having this section, not as such to preserve rare animals, but To maintain the diversity of breeds, to to broaden the gene pool for agricultural development. Greenvale changes with the seasons, with different events happening at different times of the year. May will be perhaps our most spectacular month, with the arrival of the Canada geese, and when our fruit trees will be in full blossom. But there are interesting events on all year round.、Um, for example, John Havers, our expert fly fisherman. Is currently giving displays on the lake. Each of the sections has its own seasonal calendar, and please consult the summary board at the main entrance. And the final section, as we return to the reception blocks, is the orchard. Do take time to browse round our shop. There's a wide selection of books on wildlife, some of them written by local authors, and the history of farming, including organic farming, something which the park will be diversifying into in the coming months. Good morning, everyone.、Uh, in today's seminar, Grant Freeman, a biologist who specialises in identifying insects and who works for the Australian Quarantine Service, has come to talk to us about his current research work. Right. Well,、uh, over to you, Grant. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure that you know that the Quarantine Service regulates all food brought into Australia. Well, obviously, they want to protect Australia from diseases that might come in with imported goods. But they also want to prevent insect pests from being introduced into the country, and that's where I have a part to play. Anyway, my current research involves trying to find a particular type of bee, the Asian honey bee, and finding out whether there are any of them around in various states of Australia. We discovered a few of them in Queensland once and eradicated them. Now we're pretty keen to make sure that there aren't any more getting in. Particularly to New South Wales and other states. What's wrong with Asian honeybees? Are they so different from Australian bees? Well, in fact, they look almost the same, but they are infested with mites, microscopic creatures which live on them, and which can seriously damage our own home-grown bees, or could even wipe them out. Well, what would happen if Australian bees died out? Well, the honey from Australian bees is of excellent quality, much better than the stuff the Asian bees produce. In fact, Australia exports native queen bees to a large number of countries because of this. When the European honey bee was first discovered out in the bush, we found they made really unpleasant honey, and they were also too big to pollinate many of our native flowers here in Australia. That must have had a devastating effect on the natural flora. Did you lose any species? No, we managed to get them under control before that happened. But if Asian bees got in, 
there could be other consequences. We could lose a lot of money because you might not be aware, but it's estimated that native bees' pollination of flower and vegetable crops is worth $1.2 billion a year. So, in a way, they're the farmer's friend. Oh, and another thing is if you're stung by an Asian honeybee, it can produce an allergic reaction in some people, so they're much more dangerous than native bees. How will you know if Asian bees have entered Australia? We're looking at the diet of the bird called the rainbow bee eater. The bee eater doesn't care what it eats as long as they're insects. But the interesting thing about this bird is that we are able to analyse exactly what it eats, and that's really helpful if we're looking for introduced insects. How come? Because insects have their skeletons outside their bodies, so the bee eaters digest the meat from the inside. Then they bring up all the indigestible bits of skeleton, and of course the wings, in a pellet, a small ball of waste material which they cough up. That sounds a bit unpleasant. So, how do you go about it? In the field, we track down the bee eaters and find their favourite feeding spots, you know, the places where the birds usually feed. It's here that we can find the pellets. We collect them up and take them back to the laboratory to examine the contents. How do you do that? The pellets are really hard, especially if they've been out in the sun for a few days. So, first of all, we treat them by adding water to moisten them and make them softer. Then we pull them apart under the microscope. Everything's all scrunched up, but we're looking for wings, so we just pull them all out and straighten them. Then we identify them to see if we can find any Asian bee wings. And how many have you found? So far, our research shows that Asian bees have not entered Australia in any number. It's a good result and much more reliable than trying to find live ones as evidence of introduced insects. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you, Grant, for those insights. I hope that you might inspire some of our students here to conduct some similar experiments. I've been doing some research into what people in Britain think of doctors, the ones who work in general practice, the first call for medical care, and comparing this with the situation in a couple of other countries. I want to talk about the rationale behind what I decided to do. Now, I had to set up my program of research in three different countries, so I approached postgraduates in my field in overseas departments, contacting them by email to organize things for me at their end. I thought I would have trouble recruiting help, but in fact, everyone was very willing, and sometimes their tutors got involved too. I had to give my helpers clear instructions about what kind of sample population I wanted them to use. I decided that people under 18 should be excluded because most of them are students or looking for their first job. And also, I decided at this stage just to focus on men who were in employment and set up something for people who didn't have jobs and for employed women later on as a separate investigation. I specifically wanted to do a questionnaire and interviews with a focus group. With the questionnaire, rather than limiting it to one specific point, I wanted to include as much variety as possible. I know questionnaires are a very controlled way to do things, but I thought I could do taped interviews later on to counteract the effects of this. And the focus group may also prove useful in future by targeting subjects I can easily return to, as the participants tend to be more involved. So I'm just collating the results now. At the moment, it looks as if in the UK, despite the fact that newspapers continually report that people are unhappy with medical care, in fact, it is mainly the third level of care, which takes place in hospitals, that they are worried about. Government reforms have been proposed at all levels, and although their success is not guaranteed, long term hospital care is in fact probably less of an issue than the media would have us believe. However, I've still got quite a bit of data to look at. Certainly, I will need to do more far reaching research than I had anticipated in order to establish if people want extra medical staff invested in the community. 
or if they want care to revert to fewer but larger key medical units. The solution may well be something that can be easily implemented by those responsible in local government, with central government support, of course. This first stage has proved very valuable, though. I was surprised by how willing most of the subjects were to get involved in the project. I had expected some unwillingness to answer questions honestly. But I was taken aback and rather concerned that something I thought I'd set up very well didn't necessarily seem that way to everyone in my own department. I thought you might also be interested in some of the problems I encountered in collecting my data. There were odd cases that threw me. One of the subjects, who I had approached while he was out shopping in town, decided to pull out when it came to the second round. It was a shame, as it was someone who I would like to have interviewed more closely. And one of the first year students I interviewed wanted reassurance that no names would be traceable from the answers. I was so surprised because they think nothing of telling you about themselves and their opinions in seminar groups. Then one of the people that I worked with got a bit funny. The questions were quite personal, and one minute he said he'd do it, then the next day he wouldn't. And in the end, he did do it. It's hard not to get angry in that situation, but I tried to keep focused on the overall picture in order to stay calm. The most bizarre case was a telephone interview I did with a teacher at a university in France. He answered all my questions in great detail, but then when I asked how much access he had to dangerous substances, he wouldn't tell me exactly what his work involved. It was a real eye opener. Thank you.